Today you're about to be introduced to some hot news and we are looking so forward to share this with you. I would like to bid you a very warm welcome to an hour of information and inspiration regarding our common future. My name is Abelona Warming and I am the CEO of Design Denmark. And I'm so glad that you took the time to participate today. Design Denmark and the Index Project invites you to discover the design designed to improve life goals and they are shortened DTIL and I'm sure you will hear that many times today. So DTIL means designed to improve life goals. Design Denmark work with these power talk sessions to make designers boost their business and we invite experts to share their know-how. And today's not so secret special guest star presents one of Denmark's coolest positions and does a very cool job to fill in the chair and a very important job indeed because design is not only a social lever design is also business oriented level lever and design is a very important tool to make changes for people and for planet i've been so excited about today because being ambitious and adding to the world and uh, somehow also break the rules is some of my favorite values. And it's therefore with great pleasure that I now will introduce the Index Project CEO, Lisa Chung, who will guide us all through the five current Design to Improve Life goals, but also reveal three new ones. The working behind them and how designers can address them and are addressing them. Uh, a short introduction, Lisa Chung has been leading the Index Project since 2018 and is uh, responsible for the organization's visions, operations and also the strategic decision direction because she joined already uh, index or the index project in 2009 um, and uh, penned the first official strategy and has supported in fundraising and partnership initiatives initiatives uh, that have taken the index project uh, overseas to the Nordics, the Asia and the US. Um, and today, luckily, we are all given the opportunity to learn a little more about what the index project actually is and what they do. And even though that uh, we can't hear or see you because we advise you to turn off the camera and microphone. So uh, I just want to say we can feel you. So please feel free to smile and nod and react because it is also a kind of communication in this absent world. If you have questions during Lisa's talk, uh, please write them in the chat, uh, which you get access to uh, in the little speech bubble icon in the bottom of your screen. And then I will see too that you are heard. And in the end, we will uh, cover it and present uh, the questions for, for Lisa. So, Actually, you also can, even though we can't hear you, you can applaud now because I want you to help me give a very warm welcome to Lisa Chung. Yay! Go Lisa, go Lisa. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Avalona. Hi. Thank you so much just for that warm welcome. I feel the energy. I mean, That's we good. need this energy right now. So live transmission from the blocks, we still have a little bit of light there. So I mean, there is hope. Um, so my name is Lisa Chong. I'm the CEO of the Index Project. Uh, thank you so much for your warm introduction. And thank you to Design Denmark for inviting us to be um, a feature in your series. Um, so if I may dive into it, we're going to have a one hour talk today about problems. Um, I think, quite frankly, we're probably filled to the brim with, uh, with thinking about problems. Um, but if you may, uh, be patient with me. Um, we have um, an hour of some insights, some knowledge, some inspiration that we hope uh, you can draw possibilities as a designer uh, and the possible design challenges that we we are confronted with um, so I think you know I'm gonna try and keep it light uh, even though the topics are relatively heavy um, and we understand it's uh, three o'clock in the afternoon here in Copenhagen 
uh, we've had our fair share of, of, of a struggle this year. So I, uh, I will keep it as much, uh, you know, uh, energized um, and with optimism, as I say. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I'll take you through some visuals and I'll talk you through obviously the methodology that we've uh, we've been defining uh, through the DTIL goals as you uh, revealed earlier. Uh, let me just do this. And we'll get right into it. Here we go. So, if I may, and of course, um, start with this overall vision um, and, and the, the statement that we have in terms of uh, the world and, and the problems and the perceived problems that we have right now. Um, we're no short of, of problems. I mean, um, if I cast your minds back at the start of the year, um, I think we all remember those images of the, the forest fires in Australia. And, and of course, um, you know, that's, that's not a distant memory because we've experienced quite a lot in the preceding months. But we can all agree that the world is plagued by problems. Um, but here at the Index Project, we're a firm believer that, um, that design is and can be the solution. So we believe in the power of design and design methods to solve challenges globally. Um, and, and this is an example of, of, of how we work and, and what our toolbox is. So if I could give uh, for the benefit of, of those that are not familiar to the index project, uh, just a little introduction to, to who we are. Um, the work that we're focused on is designed to improve life. It's a concept that was coined uh, back when the organization was founded in 2002 by the founding CEO, together with her partner, uh, Kiga Vil. And we're a nonprofit organization. We're based here in Copenhagen in Denmark. And what we do is we teach, award, and invest in people who use design to change the world. One of our key uh, conduits or sort of uh, mechanisms that we use to, to, to illustrate uh, design to improve life is the Index Award. So we launched uh, the Index Award in 2005. It's run as a biennale, so it's every two years. And to date, we've seen almost 8,000 nominations from over 90 countries across the world. So that's a lot of solutions and a lot of design um, ideas, solutions, whether they're in prototype phase or whether they're fully um, invested. Um, we've seen a lot of solutions that are addressing some of the most pressing problems the, the planet is facing. We have five categories and five winners, all with a total price sum of half a million euros. And those five categories are body, home, work, play and learning, community. So we don't operate as a design competition that divides um, design up into its specific disciplines, but we look at across the horizon in terms of life existence and where those designs fit within human life aspects. Um, in addition to that, um, because we are focused on design to improve life, we have parameters um, that judge where a design may, may sit within form, impact and context. So that's the judging criteria in terms of like how far a design is considered designed to improve life. In addition to the categories, as well as where a design may fit within design to improve life criteria, we work within the framework of the UN's SDGs. And we believe this is a really useful tool and a, a, a strong foundation in order to galvanize people around a global mindset um, and also build solidarity around problem solving across nations. Um, so this is a really unique uh, way to mobilize people around solution making. 
and the SDGs are a broad stroke of our common goals. So they are the priority list in terms of what we should be doing in order to improve life quality worldwide. Although many of our small worries um, that we've, we've seen across uh, time um, build up to actually more and more prevalent issues, we see a growing unaddressed market, if you want to call it that, in terms of um, emerging problems, emerging challenges that need direct addressing, attention, but most importantly, innovation. And our attention has been brought to these issues um, over the course of many years where we've been engaging with change makers, design thinkers, doers from all over the world. And in 2016, we formalized these conversations and the research that was undertaken. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> slight intermission there but anyhow yes <laughs> yeah. that was a <laughs> what was that <laughs> yeah i don't know someone felt like sharing yeah. um, but anyhow so uh, I, if i cast you back to 2016 on the on the uh, issue of uh, challenges um these um dtil goals which um which we were we had collected and penned um was published in a report called the, the Visual Field Notes. So the methodology that was used was interviews with over 140 people across different sectors and countries and continents around the world and culminating in 31 groups of identified challenges that are not related to the UN SDGs. And from that, the original five DTIL goals came out of the Visual Field Notes. Um, we, will, we, uh, we will be tagging links later on to th these publications, so, um, so there will be um, some sharing in terms of like where the, where the documents can be accessed and, and we have all of the information av available for free. So these five goals really stood out to us as like a, a formulation into the future. Where, where are we headed in terms of um, the emerging challenges that our humanity faces. Also, with regards to the fact that the UN SDGs is a tidy package of um, the, the priority list in terms of global um, problem solving, we have to look ahead in terms of where we're headed, in terms of the evolution of where our challenges may lie. So we're going to dig into the DTIL goals. And what I'll do is I'll walk you through the five original that were uh, that were um, formulated in 2016 but then I will also highlight the three new goals that were collected in 2019 um, just to sort of add to the collection and then of course what I would like to do is invite um, the audience to pose your questions if you might already have questions along the way as Abaluna mentioned please put them in the uh, the comment section and we'll see if we can get to those questions um, once the talk is over. So let's start with uh, the first one, which is uh, navigating post-factual society. So the issues around polarization and diverging understandings of truth have, have always existed within our global society. And you know, this is due to the rise of the internet, access to social media, um, navigating what's fact can can be quite a lengthy task and you know of course there is so much information out there I mean like it is a very very difficult task for any human to have to sort of chew through and crunch through data so this actually poses a huge challenge in that many don't have much trust in the news sources um, in fact it's uh, created paradigm shifts in our understanding of what is fact and what isn't fact. So adding to the fact that right now, 62% of adults worldwide believe there's a fair extent of fake news online um, and compounded 83% feel that fake news negatively affect their country's politics. So we've heard of concepts like news anxiety, echo chambers. I mean, we were like doom scrolling in 2020. I mean, like we can create plenty of memes um, with uh, with regards to you know people's attitude and connection with information right um, so filtering out news to keep our sanity keep our kind of uh, 
information balance and reinforcing our own opinions is, is very, very challenging. Um, we've seen social media and the, the, the growth of social media um, becoming reliable news sources. In fact, 41% consider uh, access or, or, or news feeds um, trustworthy sources. And so now social media platforms, you know, have to be, you know, culpable, they need to be liable in terms of uh, being able to tag the false content um, and take responsibility for the importance it has on informing people, but also the judgments and the attitudes and, and, and uh, the connections that it, it forges on people, right? So one of the, a contemporary um, documentary that we've seen on Netflix right now or that's available is The Social Dilemma. And, and, and the venture capitalist, uh, one of the early investors in Facebook says that, uh, I mean, if everyone is entitled to their own facts, there's really no need for compromise. Um, for, for people coming together, we need to have some shared understanding of reality. So, so this isn't just um, an issue related to um, what information is out there, but like, you know, this, this general understanding of what is presented as fact or not. Um, and we see this as, as, a, as a pressing um, issue, not just for now, but maybe for also the decades to come. So understanding the drivers behind post-factual society and promoting the value of factual information as sound basis for global development is our DTIL goal number one. There are solutions out there. I mean, we have seen solutions that are looking more at, um, at, at challenging this, uh, this, this issue. Um, this is an example called Logically. So this is aimed to directly help us navigate between false and factual information. So it's, it's a quick fact checking tool which hopes to improve, legitimize engagement with online information. So the makers of it describe it as a fake news search engine um, using natural language processing, machine learning and human oversight to rule out the biased content and misinformation. So moving on to the second goal, um, we're gonna dive into how we coexist with AI. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of issues wow. surrounding the balance between how we can effectively balance human artificial intelligence. There's lots of sci-fi novels, TV shows, dystopic visions of the future that may have contributed to, to um, you know, this view of, of artificial intelligence as being something that we should be scared of. Although people are warming up, um, there's still a lack of understanding um, of what AI is, how it works, and, and of course the worry that um, we can build so, AI to have much more power um, and, and influence um, beyond our control. And um, of course there's some fair criticism of AI as well and in terms of how we design and program these AIs. Um, in terms of the issues around bias and the, the bias technology um, that gets developed. So the question is also how can we control these technologies um, and, 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 and ensure that you know, we're, we're designing them in a way that, um, that, that don't prejudge or, or have uh, the overwhelming power that um, um, would influence us in the long run. So interestingly enough, we've seen the value of AI during COVID-19 um, as a significant kind of uh, example where we've seen projects that pool human data for gaining knowledge on the virus, contact centers, um, using chatbots uh, to deal with routine responses and so forth. And, and of course, AI have been used to practice safe dis distancing and detect symptoms in public spaces, you know, so we're not unfamiliar with what, what the benefits and the potential potentials are regarding uh, the use of AI. Essentially what people are fearing 
we feel is that AI will expand without the human touch um, and finding that balance uh, between human and artificial intelligence will be the key. So achieving a healthy balance between hum human intelligence and the exponential growth of art artificial intelligence is, is a DTIL goal. And there are solutions, as I mentioned. Um, so this is a great example of, of just that. Spot um, is the name of the company here that I'm showing you. It's an example of a company where AI and humans empower each other. It's a chatbot that helps employees report thorough, accurate, unbiased accounts of misconduct in the workplace. Um, so the, the bots act as neutral third party, communicating between the company and the employee who can stay anonymous. Um, so this is a, a great way of um, emphasizing anonymity, anonymity, safe and trusted ways for employees to speak up um, that's still actionable for HR departments and so forth. So the third goal I'd like to share with you is the surrounds the need for trust, tolerance, empathy. It should be no brainer that human beings need these three key elements to create solutions that not only benefit us all, but also prevent and mitigate harming others, right? So the decline in empathy not only pertains to our relation with other human beings, but also other species. You know, we, we are coexisting um, with other life forms. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it's very easy to overlook that. Um, undoubtedly, that taints our compassion, our solidarity with nature and, and the, uh, the other species that we are inhabiting this world with. Um, so the question is, have we lost empathy for the masses? Um, have we become desensitized to the suffering of others? And, and that could be either in a human capacity or in terms of sympathy or empathy for, for, for animal or plant life and so forth. Um, but, but in effect, we do see a rise in numbers of indifference. So lastly, this tendency to design without tolerance uh, and, and inclusion sets us apart in many ways. Have we designed for exclusivity is a question. So understanding others is a key to the continuous development in order for us to have a better understanding um, and a better way of uh, solving problems for, for others. So trust, tolerance, empathy. So we should be promoting more trust, more tolerance. And this is an example which I think really stands out. Um, if we're using examples of designing for inclusivity, this is a Japanese designer that um, who's called Kosuke Takahashi. The design is called Braille Noi, um, and it aims to create a bond between the sighted and visually impaired. So, so here in the image, you can see um, a little girl that's uh, that's obviously reading Braille, but uh, what, what you don't see is that the parent is able to also read uh, the text as well um, in the outlines. So this is a, a way of bringing both the sighted and the visually impaired, communicating and then sharing the experience in, in a very, very elegant way. The world is populated by 217 million visually impaired people, you know, and this is, this is quite a significant population of people. Um, and we could ask ourselves, are we doing enough or, or could we be doing more to include um, and harmonize the communication uh, possibilities between the sighted and visually impaired. So we aren't actually creating um, for one or the other, but we're creating for all. Our fourth goal points to the notion that we need to focus on innovating our financial system. So we're living in and have been for centuries uh, living and, and sort of governed, if you would say, by a capitalistic system um, that we've been prioritizing um, profit maximization over people and planet for far too long. There's hope, there's optimism, because we see more and more companies, existing companies, taking more responsibility, 
um, promising carbon neutrality, a reduction of greenhouse gases, you know, we see a lot more intentionality. Um, but it's still hard to grasp how companies are going to achieve this. Um, and, and if all aspects of their social, economic, and environmental footprints um, will really address uh, the, the, the fundamental root causes uh, and, and really challenge uh, their, own, their own habits. We're seeing technologies that are being developed right now, and of course, um, all in the right direction in terms of yeah, climate tech, uh, technologies that are explicitly focused on yeah, reducing those greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Um, but we are building them on, a, on, on financial systems which are predated. And we need to rethink um, the structures that we're building on. And of course, I am very hopeful and, and I believe that we can build companies that right from the beginning are um, focused on prioritizing people, profit and planet equally as their priorities and core to their central reason for being. So this goal addresses the lack of financial inclusion worldwide. So we're looking at examples where we can see um, people who are um, not within the means of the current systems. And I have an example here, which I'd love to show you. Um, and again, it comes back down to this question of empathy and compassion. Um, are we thinking about uh, the exclusivity and how can we as designers demonstrate ways to include um, more in, into a system that has um, their interests at heart. So this example right now that I'm showing you is one of our award nominees called Destekame um, from 2017. Um, and what the company does is provide alternative credit scoring um, using alternative data to assess individual payment behavior and credit worthiness. So of course we take this for granted um, here in, in Europe where actually um, to open bank accounts, we can do with relative ease um, and, and without much friction. But in parts of Latin America where it is harder for, uh, for, for people to, to show um, credit worthiness in, in conventional ways proves to be extremely challenging. How are there alternatives that they can prove their credit worthiness in order to, to have access to banks um, and loans and, and, and by that the social mobility to alleviate themselves from, from poverty and hardship. Um, this is a fantastic example of, of uh, ways users in Latin America can, can demonstrate their credit worthiness to financial service providers in an unconventional way. So projects like this give us a lot of hope and is a great example of innovative financial solutions. So the last DTIL goal from, from the 2016 report um, points to the ongoing and growing ref refugee migrant crisis um, that we that we've all bared witness to. So whether it's migration um, of of people and displaced people due to war, uh, devastation due to the effects of climate change, there are currently 80 million people displaced worldwide. And these people need to, first of all, be safely transported and provided with decent livelihoods. Um, but, but also as they enter new regions, new countries, um, they, they need tools and opportunities um, in order to be integrated. Still, we see refugees and migrants live under horrible conditions in, in refugee camps and, and many countries still haven't cracked that code on how to fully welcome and embrace um, their new citizens uh, and be be become part of a new community. So we, we're actually seeing 
um, uh, the, the, the challenge like head on. Um, and we see this in the EU where there is an incredibly high unemployment rate for non-EU born citizens. Um, and whilst on the other hand, we see the UN SDGs asking for reduced inequality between countries, but we in a community of designers firmly believe that there's a crisis. This is a crisis that needs urgent and dedicated response. So how do we stabilize the growing refugee and migrant crisis and promote more inclusion uh, for newcomers um, is the DTIL goal number five. So we see solutions again. So for refugees, education is not, re not readily available. In, in, and while you're starting to get to grips with your new reality, your new environment, I mean, starting a new life in a, in a foreign country can be very, very hard. Um, this is a project called Kiron. It's an online campus, free platform for, for refugees wanting to learn and their mission is to provide higher education for refugees simply through internet access. Um, so they provide tailor-made curricula uh, that lead to micro-credentials, which are recognized at local and international online universities with the hope of increasing job opportunities. So the goals of tomorrow, so those were the five that, um, that we investigated back in 2016. Um, in 2019, our partners in collaboration um, with the Index Project, uh, YAR Studio, headed by the CEO, Kiga Vilt, ran a similar exercise in interviewing and investigating the emerging challenges of the time. So optimism is blooming in a world gone mad is the, the latest report um, where we culminated all the data and identified six new groups of challenges and three have become DTIL goals. And I'm gonna walk you through the, the three that we, um, that we find really exciting. Sustainable tourism is the first one. So whilst it might seem such a foggy distant memory of, of what tourism even feels like, um, one thing we can, we can all agree on is that as humans, um, we have a curiosity to discover, to, to experience new cultures, to learn. Um, and being the intrepid travelers, um, you know, tourism and commercial tourism has, has created some devastation. Um, so commercial air travel really took off in the 1950s and, and drove down the costs for, for air flight. Um, and tourists arrived and, and they kept arriving and became an industry and, and of course enriched a lot of people um, either through culture or through economic means. Um, in 2018 alone, there were 1.4 billion tourists arriving worldwide. Um, and, and of course, um, whilst this year the pandemic has really put a hold on any kind of uh, global tourism, the rise of and access to travel to parts of the world has really come at a cost. So search for historical landmarks and hidden gems have really proved to harm communities and ecosystems. So for instance, in Thailand, um, Maya Bay closed to recover from the damage caused by over-tourism. I mean, we've seen pictures of obviously Venice, Amsterdam, Barcelona. Yes, it creates financial gain, um, but it comes at a cost. Um, and, and that affects local citizens. It affects housing, affordability, mobility, and environmental degradation. So it's a quote from a tourism consultant that, you know, we cannot be complacent um, to rely on others to do good. And we all have to take personal responsibility. So uh, I guess sort of as we enter 2021 with a COVID vaccination now and, you know, kind of a hope to get reality, you know, we, we also have to rethink our patterns for, for how we want to live life and how we want to explore and discover the world. Um, and, and this is this comes a very, very timely 
um, place in history. So how do we build and boost sustainable tourism models that minimize the impact um, on global ecosystems, but also can improve livelihoods of locals? Because of course we know locals are very dependent on, uh, on, on tourism. So this is an example that, um, that we've seen called fairbnb.coop. Um, so it works exactly like Airbnb, um, except it's a cooperative model. Um, where you can book accommodation in much the way like Airbnb, but um, the proceeds promotes and funds local initiatives and projects. So the host earns the same and the guest pays the same. The benefits are for the community. Um, so this is, you know, an example of community powered tourism and, and, and an opportunity to participate in a more equitable, sustainable tourism model. So this is one example of how we could do it, right? The next uh, DTIL goal is leaders with ethics. Um, so why is this important? Well, we've entered a really critical decade where it comes to fulfilling the UN SDGs. I mean, we've just had the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, you know, these are the most pressing, uh, if you would say, sort of deadlines of our time. You know, we, we have to mobilize as a global community to reach these goals because if we don't there will be dire consequences um, but how do we do that uh, in order to do that we need to have trust in the leaders that we elect to governments and we need to believe that we can mobilize around the issues that are most pressing and and work goddamn hard to reach those goals right so it is critical um, and uh, the, the damage of climate change is, is real. Leave the science. As of today, the capability lies within the hands of our world leaders. Um, but are they responsible with the power they've been given? I mean, I think we all have our views and our opinions here. Um, let's look at some data. 64% of the global community show no trust in the former president Donald Trump to do the right thing in world affairs, and neither Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping scored above 50% level of confidence. We need both world leaders to be more morally upstanding than the average citizen. But on both a local and global, people are finding more and more of that hard to believe. So through our report, people raise concerns that this problem would be hard to solve due to apathy, uh, people not getting involved, um, neither on the right, right or left, um, and, and just maybe a broken political system that we just find um, harder to relate to. Um, so leadership is about results and ethics, and, and we're missing this ethical element and the moral compasses to benefit humankind so if we cannot if, if we can agree that um that that there is a philosophical kind of um imperative to to place ethics in the heart of uh the way we train uh, the way we we live think breathe uh, how our heart beats um it's just this is the time that we need to be reflecting. And, and again, once again, COVID has forced us to have these deep uh, reflections. Everything else can be technical. And I would, I would agree with Teddy's quote here that um, everything else will, will fall into place. But as long as we have our moral compasses in place, we have a, a stand um, and, a, 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 and a chance. So creating a global code of ethics for leadership at all levels and develop better tools to hold leaders accountable for their actions is, is one of the goals. We've seen a, an example. Um, this is a, a Finnish design. It's a set of tools for addressing empathy deficit um, at the heart of power. So it's created by a designer called Eni Kuka Tuomala. It proposes new rituals, perspectives, communications through play. Um, this is kind of uh, unusual in many ways when you, you see sort of uh, a different kind of like uh, 
attitude when it comes to politics, but maybe this is actually what we, we need um, a little bit more of. Um, and it's a collection of tools that are based on physical body language, gestures, expressions of politicians designed to awaken the human side of politics. So how do we create ethics within politics is a fundamental here. Lastly, generational harmony. So we face the challenge of creating better bonds between generations. I think to many, it's, it's been a meme, you know, a meme bomb of like terms like snowflake, woke generation, that dichotomy of uh, Zoomer versus Boomer. I mean, we're seeing a, a deep and wider gap between generations. Um, and, and of course, it's a, a sort of a young versus old that's growing increasingly um, divided. Uh, but groups have become polarized, and, uh, as we've seen around identity politics and so forth. Um, and, you know, of course, the culture and the, the, the environment around politics and the, the way that has, um, you know, left us um, uncompassionate towards one another. In Britain, um, we see um, the youth populations feeling more and more unrepresented by their leaders um, regarding Brexit. Um, in Nigeria, youth are rebelling against police brutality and political disempowerment. I mean, it continues. So breaking down barriers between generations comes with the task of empowering both. Um, maybe this is about listening, uh, a better listening exercise, uh, the means to creating opportunities, uh, jobs for youth, for instance, designing for elderly and so forth. And, and there's a lot to be gained from empowering um, both sides of the coin. So we see a huge opportunity in creating that bond. Um, and as leadership professor Megan Gerhardt feels that we should be stop generation shaming and name calling and scapegoating. I mean, let's, uh, let's look at uh, the differences and see how we can harmonize um, within those differences. So strengthening and understanding between generations and creating models for improved inclusivity uh, between age groups is our last goal. So there are constructive exchanges that bridge the divide. This is um, a Danish organization called ElderLearn um, that pairs elderly Danish people with immigrants wanting to help with learning Danish. I mean, um, the primary goals are to help migrants learn the language and of course to, uh, to help lonely elders with uh, companionship. Uh, but furthermore, elder learn also creates space for conversation between different age groups, cultures and creating bonds. So that's the DTIL goals. Um, they're in a long list and I think there's so much information there. I think what I would say uh, to you as an audience of designers, I think that the challenges are, are, are yours to take uh, as, as they are for us to kind of promote and also um, get depth in the analysis, um, but they're present and they're emergent, uh, but they're also urgent. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any that you might have. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, could you end your presentation? Yep. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, you make me very thoughtful. I have lots of lots of yellow posted <laughs> labels here. <laughs> I wasn't meant to have, but I do. Um, no. And I think that's often, uh, you know, when question is answered uh, and you get enlightened, uh, new questions appear. And that's yeah. because you, you make your inspiration. Uh, I think it was so interesting about what you said about, you know, the, the false truth versus beliefs. And I mean, um, a, a lot of human race has based uh, our, our lives on that. Uh, just look at religion, but let's not talk about that. Um, but I think uh, it's a human thing that you're very eager to find. Mm. But I also think that it's a balance because you also need some unknown stuff, a bit of a magic. 
But I think what is very important for us working as designers is, of course, the moral compass, uh, but also trust because it's a key word when you work with design because what you are entering is all the time unknown land. And you need to have people joining in and they need to join in in something they don't know what will end up with. So it's a very uh, important word. And I think that's also why it's so important that you have this uh, index award show because that is concrete examples on, on, on what uh, design can do. And I was totally blown away about, about the Braille example. I haven't mm. seen it before. And it's yeah. so logical and it's so uh, simple and it's kind of brilliant, I think. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and I have actually, we have um, a question about the, the because, because I, I'm interested in uh, the designer's point of view. And, I mean, there's a lot of goals and now you haven't made it easier because you have added some, <laughs> but which goal do you feel is the most urgent one? And how can you see uh, the designer's role in, in this solving these things? What's a really the hard question. I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, it's like, you know, I, I believe in, in, in systems and even, you know, when you have a tidy grid that are color coded and so forth, I mean, they're never modular, and they're never just sort of like standalone. There's always things that connect. And, and of course, um, for me, I guess like just today on a on a Tuesday late afternoon, I really believe that uh, the, the the leadership question, mm -hmm. the ethical leadership, is is for me, I guess, you know, um, uh, leaves like me a sense of. I, I need to feel hope as a as a person, you know, uh, but also like in terms of, yes, we lead an organization that is, is trying to uncover truths, um, you know, through solution making and, and you know, present um, an understanding of, of other people uh, and other people's realities. Um, but I really feel if, if, uh, if people, particularly leaders, could think more like designers, um, we we would stand a stand a chance, right? You know, I mean, yeah. I really believe that 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 sense of sort of empathy and um, you know the, the the thoroughness in in terms of uh, researching and 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 working across different disciplines and you know presenting different realities and the listening exercises. I mean, like I think we're just as you mentioned in your your sort of little outro there. I mean. The unknowns. I think the unknowns just scare us. You know, we nobody wants to, you know, like subscribe to a leader that just doesn't know. But I mean, we we don't know fifty percent of the time, more, more than fifty percent of the time. But isn't you know, I mean, I mean, some something that makes this different is that we're not always led by leaderships or leaders. We are also led by each other and. Uh, platforms and companies and I mean there's a lot of leaderships uh, in the world so Absolutely. I mean how, how, how do you feel that designers can be part of that leadership as you said it would be nice if some leaders would think as a designer because designers need to solve problems but um, hmm. I think it's, it's the level of complexity right I think you know um, have we created um, structures and systems that have become so complex and so complicated that they are really for the specialist and the specialist alone to solve. I, I, I would say no, and you need people who can think laterally and think across different, uh, different levels of depth and be able to listen. Um, analyze um you know we don't want paralysis of analysis either where you know you're just stuck in analyzing and analyzing and analyzing and waiting for the truth to pop up before you say something i mean i think there is something with design is just being able to test ideas and just you know okay we might be wrong but just that knowing that you're wrong will teach you something or you'll learn something in that process right yeah. so i just feel there's a bravery and a courage that comes with having those skill sets of mm. of understanding okay well you know i know i might be wrong 
but I might also be right. But I'm willing to also go with the fact that I will be wrong. You know, you, yes. you, you have a sense of trust and you trust yes. in yourself. And, so, and actually, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You're done. <laughs> but also yeah. there's a question actually to you about how you manage the index project, because uh, how do you evaluate the success of the index project? Um, and what is your biggest challenge? It's a question from one of the audience. Yeah. So <laughs> how do you know, walk your talk? <laughs> I don't think it's easy. I mean, I, no. I think there's, there's um, obviously there's many different hats one has to wear. And I think, you know, there is that sense of, you know, we, we, we know that, um, you know, we're potentially subscribing to a set of, you know, pragmatics that we're saying, okay, well, in order to, you know, to to improve the state of the world via like uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and CO two, etc., we have to we have to work a certain way. Or we have to um, act and function in another. And I think I think we're just much um, amongst other companies and peers in 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 the world that are trying to figure out how to transition to actually be better. Uh, not just thought leaders, but you know, to walk the talk and to mm. to really um, unlearn um, old habits because we were told, you know, by business definitions, you have to to be a certain way in order to be a kind of a credible business or a credible organization. You know, we kind of created the standards, and now we have to unpick those standards uh, and and find ways that are more fitting to you know, functioning uh, with integrity, with authenticity, with understanding that, you know, um, we represent, you know, one part of the world, but there's another part of the world that are so unheard and so far from, from where we are. So I think, you know, it isn't an easy job being indexed. It's definitely, um, it's, it's getting easier to, to, to understand where the fight is, um, but we are doing our best. <laughs> And, yeah. and as you mentioned before, that one of the, the big tasks uh, is, of course, the index award. And uh, do you know, do you have an idea? I mean, how, how big a role does the DTIL goals play in that uh, when you assess the nominees for the index award in 2021? So definitely. Are they essential? Uh, I mean, they're, they're a part. Um, essential insofar as you know for us we're collecting data to find out of, of course you know uh, from a problem solution sort of uh, dichotomy um, what are designers you know solving out there and and of course you know you know the SDG framework is really useful to see okay well how many solutions or do we see that sort of fit within that 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 tidy grid but then we, we also can't be kind of like completely fixed on that framework. We also have to sort of expand ourselves and start looking at other goals. And the DTIL goals are very useful in the sense that, okay, well, the, there is going to be an evolution in challenges um, out there. And let's start seeing where the designers are sort of addressing their attention um, because maybe it is something that is a, a mix of both um, something that, that works towards eradicating poverty, but also has a balancing AI and human intelligence element to it. So I think there's there's gonna be some remixing um, in our view, for sure. Um, essential, I think it's always essential to, to, to know how people are, are solving problems and what, the, what kind of problem they are solving. Mm. So I think in that sense, it is quite a, an important part. Yeah. We have a very alert participant because she has actually read <laughs> the invitation <laughs> because she says you call these goals after the SDGs pointing on the emerging challenges you have presented here, but the world have just begun working on the solution of the SDGs. How do mm. you see the connection between the SDGs and the DTIL goals for the designers? Do you have a yeah, view on I, that? <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a view. I mean, like, no, the the SDGs was uh, you know, pre SDGs it was MDGs. I mean, I'm old enough uh, to to remember the MDGs as well. And of course, you know, we 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 hit um, 
you know, the uh, 2015 milestone where they were launched with great fanfare, you know, we've given ourselves until 2030, you know, I mean, like, I think in our lifetime, we'll see evolution of, of, of challenges, and some will be addressed, solved, you know, taken off the list, and there'll be new ones replaced, I think, for, for, for as long as we exist on this planet, we'll keep creating problems, um, mind you. Um, so I, I, I'm not fixed on okay, well, um, where the where the work starts and ends, but I, I definitely think we've given ourselves a time limit with the SDGs in terms of like okay, mobilizing, getting people accountable towards uh, 2030 to see how much mm. can we really, really empower people to really solve and mm. um, prioritize them. But I think you know, with with that, we also have to be conscious of. Uh, the stuff that is on the horizon it's a little yeah. bit like having a kid you know you, you get past the toddler stage and you're like oh my god as long as I get past this <laughs> then you're like okay but they get bigger and they get they have bigger yeah. problems so it's it's sort of like you know we we it, it, it will never be a tidy checklist no, no but so maybe that's like not the to. point <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's but, not the but point, we will yeah. also learn along the road and I think uh, every challenge gives some learning in the end Absolutely. Uh, Lisa, yes, yes or no? Um, are you optimistic about the future? I'm always optimistic. That's good. So um, Thank you. I, I, I live with optimism and I, I hope everyone <laughs> oh, does as yes. well. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so Lisa, much for the thank you. Yeah. Thank you for making this grey and rainful day very special after all. Uh, and thank, thank you, you for bringing us hope some, uh, somehow. Um, and thank you all for attending. Now we must take care and see that 2020 is put away very uh, gently and hopefully us also the COVID-19 and make room for uh, 2021 uh, with hopefully a lot of hugs <laughs> and a lot of kiss. Yeah. Anyway, for you, a virtual hug from here and um, have a very nice evening. Thank you so Thank much. You all. <laughs> Thank you, you so much for your time. I, I, I almost think we can say see you next year. Not in El Dorado, <laughs> but somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye. You Thank too. you so Bye. much. Bye.